Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. I'm so excited today. We have Bill Northern joining us, who's a master dowser and animal communicator. Bill Northern is a master and actually has united both dowsing and animal communication. He is known as a horse psychic and equine consultant. He has also helped people find their lost animals to be able to find out what's wrong with animals when they're upset about something or when they've been hurt or just whatever they're thinking. There's a mystery to his work. He's considered a kind of Dr. Doolittle of the modern day. I find him very humble and refreshing. We're going to hear about his stories today of his life experience and professional experience. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Bill Northern to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Morning. Thank you for having us. We're so excited to have you. I never even knew about you till yesterday. <laughs> it's like finding a jewel in the desert. Oh, thank you. Talk a little bit about how you first got into dousing. Let's go way, way back. I understand that your father passed when you were very young. Talk a little bit about that and how that changed your life and how you got to dousing. Basically, my father had a little dry goods store and really sort of brought me up in business. I I could make change for a $20 bill when I was just six years old. So just as six-year-old, I got to, you know, be in the store and do a collecting job. Anyway, he passed away when I was just seven, and uh, as natural, I was just heartbroken. But I knew there had to be a way that I could contact him. I knew there had to be a way, but I just couldn't find my way. And growing up, uh, in fact, my second grade teacher, I, I found this after my mother passed, had sent home a note saying that if Billy would get his mind off of magic, he could probably do better in school. <laughs> and, of course, this was all considered magic then. Uh, all during school, I wrote papers on paranormal subjects, and teachers would be very critical of that's all I was interested in. In fact, when I was in college, one of my English professors told me that if I couldn't write about something else, he was just going to automatically fail me. And I didn't write about anything else, and he automatically failed me. So I realized sort of that this wasn't a thing other people were interested in. Did it scare you or bother you that people weren't oh. interested and you were so interested in what they weren't interested in? Oh, I knew, I knew this existed. I knew it, but I just couldn't prove it. I would go out and cut branches off of a tree and see if I could use it. But I, I read these books, but the books really, for me, never worked. So what happened years later, I was operating a janitor and paper supply business and the toilet stopped up. When you have three women working, you have to have toilets. <clears throat> I couldn't get a plumber. I had a snake, and my snake wouldn't reach the blockage. So I called the town office to come over and try to find where the sewer line connected from my store to the town. And they brought over the engineering plans, and we dug. This was on a hot May day. And wasn't there. We dug a few feet this way and a few feet that way and just wasn't there. That's when I learned that the engineering plans that are furnished to the to the towns and cities aren't always what they're supposed to be. Right. So anyway, they came back over with one of these electronic things that they use to find lines. And that found a line but it was one of the old terracotta lines from a school building that used to be around. So that wasn't what we wanted. So they went back over and they got their dowsing rods. They brought two L rods over. And sure enough, the L rods crossed. We dug there, and there was the pipe we were looking for. I said, do you mind if I try that? And sure enough, they worked for me. I was so excited. That very day, I went to the library, and they happened to have two books on dowsing. I got them, and I believe I read both of them the same night, if I'm not mistaken. I was just so excited. And I found out they had an American Society of Dowsers. So I signed up right away to attend that meeting there in Lindenville in August. Well, I did 
fairly well with, with my L rods. I could find most anything anybody else could. I had trouble with my Y rods and, and my pendulum. But anyway, uh, what gave me the animal thing was I was sitting there. A lady had brought in two horses. And they've never done it since, and I don't think they've ever done it before. And she had the same 20 questions for each horse. Now, these horses were probably 300 feet away from us. And I don't, at that time, I don't standard bred trotters for probably 20 years. What is that, a certain kind of horse? Standard breds are trotting horses, pacing horses. I don't know anything about horses. Okay, well, uh, the standard bred horses are considered an American thing, but they raise, they raise trotters and paces in Europe, too. But uh, they, the trotter moves, is, say, right front and left hind at the same time, and a pacer moves the right front and right hind at the same time. Completely different gates, but they're, natu- they're not natural gates. They're becoming natural now, but at that time... You had to really shoe the horses in order to get them to do those proper gates. It wasn't hard on them. It was just when they went fast, they would want to break stride. Anyway, I was kind of tired of paying these couple thousand dollar a month vet bills when they had no clue what was wrong with my horses. And I didn't do very well on a test that day. I think I got five right on one horse and seven on the other. I'm a very slow thinker. And that night, it came to me that most of the people that were getting 17, 18, 19 right on both of those horses were people from New York City. Now, at that distance, those people probably would not have known a horse from a cow. (laughs) And that's natural. They wouldn't have. So I said, they really were dowsing. They didn't know anything. They were just dowsing everything. So right then, I decided if those people could do it, so could I. So that's when I really started working on my dowsing to use and communicating with animals. Even though we've done shows with Raymond Grace, who's awesome, and I realize you have a history with Raymond Grace that's awesome, tell the audience in your translation what dowsing is. I guess there are lots of of different... uh, things that you could say about dowsing, but for me, it's being able to listen to your body because your body actually knows almost all of these things. If you think about the aboriginals in, in Australia, which is probably the best example, they can look out across the desert and just see where water is. They can look at a horse or look at an animal, look at a plant, and just they're listening to their body, and they know these things. They don't have dowsing tools. They just know them. So over the years, I've learned that if we're willing to listen, our body already knows these things. And often when I'm teaching, and particularly when I have people, say, like you, that are pretty much in tune, I'll say, just close your eyes and walk forward and tell me where the electric line is, or tell me where the water line is, or maybe tell me where this underground stream is. And most people, if they just close their eyes and move forward slowly... Now, are they moving forward in their mind's eye at that point, or you're physically having them move? No, they visualize in their mind what they want to look for. Very good. And you'd be surprised how many people just find it. They just feel it's there. And that's really what it is, and and everybody can do it, but most of us, including me, have a hard time disengaging their brain. This was something that that absolutely astounded me when I learned. I didn't know why I knew the L-Rods worked. Uh, Later on, when I learned to use the pendulum better, I knew that worked. Even right today, uh, I was making a hotel reservation, but I I have three cards. I'm just using business cards. And on the back of one, I write yes. On the back of another, I write no. And on the back of another, I write either, or it doesn't matter. And before I made the hotel reservations, I doused my cards. And I got a yes. So I went on and made a reservation at this hotel. But your angels will rarely ever tell you wrong. Rarely ever. Sometimes it may seem like it, 
But a few days later, you realize that they told you right. And I have a cute story about that if you have a couple minutes for me to tell you. Yes, I do. And then before you tell the story, I want you to just say how you got into the animal communication side because they're connected, but they're very different. Talk about the animal communication side. Okay. Explain it to the public. What is animal communication? All right. Well, basically, animal communication, I've got to tell you this. When I started off, I would just look at a joint on an animal and ask, does this hurt? And if my pendulum said yes, I knew it was a problem. If it said no, I knew it wasn't a problem. And that was just what I did for probably about four or five years. And and you, you're extremely accurate. You're just sitting there. You, you disengage your brain. You don't know whether it hurts or not. You don't want the people telling you anything. You just want to douse it. So that's what I did. And back around 1998, I guess it was, Public television came here to this little town I live in in Virginia and did a special with us. And we drove, had this standard bred horse. He was a pacer. And during the course of the day, they shot this thing literally 12 hours. During the course of the day, they took this horse out, or I took this horse out on the track and had him go around the track, and they followed us with the cameras. Now, I always, I have some apple trees here at home, and I always took apples up to the farm, to the racetrack for the horses. And a couple of days after the shoot for public television, I walked in the barn, and all of a sudden, I heard this voice say, I didn't get my apple today. And I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. <laughs> so I went over, and I looked in a stall of where I thought it came from, which was a horse we'd been working with. His name was Freeholder. It wasn't anybody in there but Freeholder. And then I looked in the next stall, went to the other side, looked in the stalls around. There was nobody in those stalls but horses. And again, I heard, I didn't get my apple today. So I called down to the other end of the barn. where I'll get a tear every time I tell this. Okay. Uh, called down to the barn, it, it, other end of the barn where Bernice was working. And I said, Bernice, Freeholder said he didn't get his apple today. And she said, oh, he did too. He's just having you on. So as I walked away, this real sad voice said, no, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down and I talked to Bernice for a few minutes, and all of a sudden, Bernice said, you know, I did forget to give him an apple. How did you know? And I said, because he told me. And it was years before she would even believe that. Wow. So that's the first time I actually heard a voice from an animal. And from then on, I was hearing them almost like I hear you. That's amazing. Really, it, it is. is. It is. That's really great. I mean, you obviously love animals. Well, I, I've always had dogs, but it never knew how to deal with them. I always thought an animal was supposed to do what I wanted it to do at the time I wanted to do it. And now I've learned that they have feelings just like we do. Absolutely. Exactly like we do. And some days they feel better than they do at others. And it's one of these things that you really need to learn to pay attention to them rather than making them do what you want to do. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. The Declaration of a National and International Water Crisis is a declaration about water that comes directly from snowmelt and rainfall. It has nothing to do with the water that exists below your feet, underground, into faulted structures all over the world. I want you to know that there is an unlimited supply of available fresh water everywhere on Earth, including the deserts. For over 100 years, teams of people have been locating water for private people. The reason you haven't heard of it is that it is not part of the mainstream orthodoxy of geology that's taught at universities. When you think about people and animals in developing nations having to walk miles to bring back a bucket of water, I want you to know that that is an unacceptable atrocity. Nobody should have to go through that. I've made a commitment to make water available to sophisticated investors and people in need across the world. And to make commercial applications available for water in the United States and abroad 
There's only a water crisis as it relates to snowmelt and rainfall, not having to do with the third source of water, which is below our feet. If you are a sophisticated investor or a farmer that would be interested in having your own water supply that is independent of the aquifers, feel free to call It's Rainmaking Time. The good news is that there's plenty of water everywhere for anybody and any animal on planet Earth that needs it. Thank you very much. And back to the show. I got a new dog, a rescue, in January, first week of January, that was tied to a wire for two years. I went to see her and walk her on Saturday, and she just cried out. Not a normal cry. And I knew something had happened. I don't know what happened. But I decided that after being with her and just, like, observing her for two days to not walk her for a week, just literally be with her, but don't have her pushing you know, and pulling. She's a husky, a white husky. People have called me Dr. Doolittle with animals. I sing to them. I talk to them. I am a dowser. I don't do it for a living, but I think it's so extraordinary. I guess my question to you is how did you open up that side of you or did it just start happening as you were dousing around animals? If you had known me 20 years or 25 years before that, you would never have thought that I could do it because all I had on my mind was my business and I was working at least 12 hours a day, six days a week. That was always on my mind. And when I went to Dowsing School and saw the things that I could do, it, it just changed my life completely. In fact, I came home and I put both of my businesses up for sale, sold them. I knew this is what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I think it's so fascinating. When my dog was hurt, or however she got hurt, people were telling me, oh, rush her to the doctor, get all these x-rays, take all this blood tests and everything. And something said to me inside, it's not going to make any difference what you do, what the tests are. You could go through thousands of dollars of tests. You'll never get to what happened, and you'll never get to where she's hurting and what it's about. So I doused the question, does she need an x-ray? I got to know. Does she need blood tests? I got to know. Will the doctor or vets be able to do anything at this time? I got to know. And I also had the feeling it's not going to make any difference right now. So dowsing can be very helpful at making critical decisions, even when you think sometimes it's urgent or you need to do something. And conventionally, when something happens to our animals, we think, oh, rush the animal to the vet. Well, unless it was hit by a car, like something happened, it landed in a trap or it's bleeding. But something subtle, more subtle, like the animal bruised something or hurt something or maybe a pinchner, you don't know. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with Uh, me? No, look, that's exactly right. I have written to every veterinary school in this country, I believe, asking if I could come and teach their students how to douse, how to do this. And do you know not the first one has even answered my letter? I totally accept what you're saying. It's kind of like when you were talking about getting an engineer to be open to dousing. Let's take a perfect example. In California, there is a stated water crisis here, state of emergency. But the reality is if they would use dowsers, they would find out there's plenty of water here. And by the way, everywhere, but they don't. The municipalities and the governments won't go to a dowser who can find the water. It's kind of like if I were to say to you, Bill, look, you know, I don't have any food in my pantry or I don't have any food in my refrigerator, but I keep going back to the refrigerator and I keep going back to the pantry. And somebody says to me, hey, Kim, turn to your right, walk 15 feet. There's your food. In fact, there's a whole farm. You'll be set for life. But that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Well, may I ask you a question? Sure. I've been told that now California, among some other states, actually has laws that prohibit dowsers from locating water. Okay, well, here's what I was told by a dowser, which I obviously, for reasons we all understand, won't mention. This is a guy who's done like 8,500 wells. He says that if he ever puts in a contract how he finds the water, the Department of Contractors threatened to sue him and shut him down. Yeah, I know there's something going on out there that, that sort of makes it quite precarious for a, a dowser. Just because I was, you know, you can find these things remotely too. And I can remember, uh, I believe it was a couple of years ago, somebody uh, sent me a drawing and asked me to locate some water on it. 
And I just call another dialer right that way because I always recommend somebody close if possible. And he said, Bill, you get yourself in a lot of trouble. You don't want to do that here. So I didn't. You know, I don't know that that's totally true. I mean, there's a lot of dowsers that are working here. It's when you get to the drillers that the problem is. It's kind of like the Wall Street traders or stockbroker makes money whether the client wins or loses, right? Correct. They just move the money and they get paid. Well, drillers just get paid to drill. Whether they find anything or not is irrelevant. So the compensation system in these industries is part of the problem. Oh, look, it could be. It, it's... It's just one. I was told that it was a geologist in California that had had this. Uh, I don't say law, but something that bill passed that uh, prohibited dowsers from doing this, and and they've also tried to do that in Vermont, right where the, the headquarters is of the American Dowser Society. I'm not sure it went through, but it was brought up two years ago, uh, and it was on the docket to prohibit dowsers from locating uh, water for people. So anyway, there is uh, a problem. And go back to animals, it's the same thing. Yes. You'll find that, and it's, it's over with now, more or less, but 20 years ago, the veterinarians were trying to outlaw people doing acupuncture. Now that the veterinarians can get a shingle to put on a wall saying they can do acupuncture, they're not against it anymore. But the thing of it is, with veterinarians, unless it's changed, and I haven't looked at this for a couple years, but when I was paying attention to this, veterinarians only had to go to a class for six weekends, and they could put a shingle on the wall saying that they were qualified to do acupuncture. I don't know a whole lot about acupuncture, but I know in China... Uh, Japan, over in the Far East, it takes you about 10 or 12 years to get that certificate. Right. It's a whole different thing. And, of course, there's such animal exploitation, both in the agriculture area, in the food supply area. The animals have really taken it. And they've taken it in the veterinary industry because they are now downloaded with shots and injections and all kinds of things which are hurting and killing human beings and now they're getting the same protocols. So it's very complex. They're basically been assimilated into biological things that are not even good for humans either. So talk a little bit about some of your stories in doing animal communication that you think the public would really enjoy. It happens to me just, just on a regular basis. Uh, I was just working with a, a horse, excuse me, a dog in Hawaii, and uh, when I was there... The dog had told me that it didn't like for the lady to get up on a ladder. And she said, Bill, I think you must be listening to the wrong dog. I don't even have a ladder. And I said, okay, you know, I, I could be. It's very possible that could happen. So we talked for maybe two or three more minutes, and she said, oh, Bill, I did borrow a ladder from my neighbor last week. <laughs> Another one that comes to mind, they're always happening, but the one that comes to mind was a horse out in New Mexico. Uh, it was a, a mare, and she'd been racing pretty well, and, and the owner had sold her. And she stayed in the same barn, but she just stopped trying to win. She just stopped trying. She was finishing in the back of the pack all the time. So the trainer called me and asked me what was wrong with her. So... She started sort of the gossip and stuff like they'll do sometimes. First thing she told me was she didn't like the uh, color, new color of her trainer's hair. She she didn't like that new color very well. So I had to tell her I wasn't interested in the gossip side. So all I want to know is where, where she hurt and what was going wrong with her. So she told me a few places that she hurt. And then she said, they expect me to race in these sissy colors. You know I like red. They know I like red, and they're making me race in these sissy colors. And the new owner had these real pale brute colors, even paler than you'd have for a new baby. And she just wasn't going to race in those colors. So she said that she would try harder if they would give her some red colors. The trainer was able to make arrangements with the track to get her to have mostly red in her colors. And after that, the horse was second the next race, 
one in x-rays and a third in x-rays. Wow. Just by changing the colors. So it could be what we would consider as humans an insignificant change that to the animal makes a huge difference. Yeah, well, see, it wouldn't be insignificant to me if you told me I had to go out and go to the store today wearing a real pale blue shirt. I totally get that. I mean, yeah. but the human perception of the animal is that the animal doesn't pay attention to that kind of stuff. There's all this projection that animals aren't telepathic. There's projection that animals don't feel what we feel, that they don't think about things or have a life experience. You know, among horses and probably dogs too, but among horses, there's this feeling that horses can't tell the difference in colors. And I happen to know that that's not exactly right. Now, they see colors slightly different than we do. But the reason I know that's not correct is that probably three or four times a year, somebody will call me and want to know why their horse refused to jump. And I'll ask them what number it was. So I will go back with the horse, and normally it starts a couple jumps, sometimes three jumps before they actually stop. But the horse will show me what color it was. Wow. But they know the colors now. In all fairness, they see reds like we see reds. They see yellow a little bit different than we do. If, if it's sort of a pale yellow, it's even paler to the horse. If it's a bright yellow, it's even brighter to the horse. Uh, but they, they can show me the, the, the jumps that they went over and what the rider did wrong at those jumps before they stopped. And you can see that? Yeah, if they didn't, if they weren't able to see colors, they couldn't show them to me, could they? No. Here's the thing, too. From the listener point of view, how does the listener know that your translation is direct from the animal rather than an impression from an angel or from God translating on behalf of the animal? I don't even know that. All I know is that I'm looking at a picture of the horse. Probably I don't have to have that, but let's say I am. And then the horse is showing me, answering my questions, showing me what's going on. So I don't really know. I know I have angels that help me all the time. Now, do you pray and ask for those angels to come forward every day? Oh, they're, with me. they're with me all the time. Okay. You can call as many angels as you need. I have four that are just with me all the time. But I can call in more if I need them for some reason. Now, what about people that call you some animal's behavior is shifted or it starts crying and you don't know what the problem is? Do you also translate on behalf of a remedy? Does a remedy usually come to you as well? I don't normally do that. Oh, well, some remedy. I'll, I'll take that back if it's a common remedy. Uh, I'll say yes. Maybe if, it's, maybe if the animal has a liver problem or a bladder problem, you know, apple cider vinegar always works for that. Maybe they have stomach ulcers. Yogurt always works for that. So that I can recommend because that's just common knowledge. Right, but when you're doing your animal communication, aren't you also getting an impression whether they need an x-ray or what would be good to do? You know what I'm saying? I ask. Yeah. I always ask my angels if that should be done. One of my angels is a, a, reti was, is a retired veterinarian who always was good to me. And he's with me all the time. So he gives me a lot of good advice in that line. But what I will normally do is if there, let's, let's just say there are three different medicines you can take, or even two, doesn't matter, then I will douse which one will be the most beneficial for this particular animal. Okay. So I don't come up and say that we need a medicine for this. I, will, I tell people what's wrong. You know, if, if the horse has a liver problem, I can pick that up. Uh, a fellow you probably have heard of by the name of Doug Gray, who's a First Nation person in Canada, taught me how to enter an animal's body. And I can look through their, through their eyes and see what they're seeing. When I look, used to look for lost animals, that was one of the first things I did, was look through the animal's eyes to see what they were looking at. And that was, that was pretty good. Uh, a lot of times it was just perfect spot on. I had to stop doing that because I actually had gotten so well known. I was getting calls from literally all over the world. And while I could print out maps from 
Greece or Germany or over in Thailand. I could print the maps out, but I couldn't read the streets. I didn't know what they were. And it was so frustrating for me trying to communicate with somebody that didn't speak English. Yeah. I didn't speak their language either. And then trying to tell them on a map where their dog was, uh, or cat or whatever, it, it got so frustrating I just stopped it two years ago. But I, I was that accurate that I was actually getting calls from all over the world. Wow. How about just continuing it in the U.S.? Well, it's kind of hard to tell people that you only do that. Now, I hadn't thought of that, but I guess I could do that. If you still enjoy doing it, how long does it take you to identify if an animal is still alive? Well, I can usually do that in just a matter of seconds from a photograph. Sure. That's not the problem. I guess, I guess another thing that always troubled me was that, that animals move, particularly dogs. And you would tell somebody that their dog is at 6 and Gray Street. When they get off work that night, they go to 6 and Gray Street, and they don't see the dog, so they, they say you're all wrong. I see. Have you ever doused and asked the question, in an hour, where will the dog be? You know, I, I have, but I wasn't very accurate with that. Okay. You're better in the real time. Real time, where's the yeah, dog? Somebody told me that you could do that. I have not learned yet to douse into the future. And I can do it sometimes, don't get me wrong, like when, and this wasn't any, I guess a lot of people knew it, but back in 07, I knew that there was a bubble of break about to burst, so I sold my house in New Zealand, and I sold my house in Kentucky about six months before this all blew up. Wow. So I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what. So it wasn't something that I could put my finger on, and it's just like right now. Things don't usually happen that everybody's expecting. Right now, everybody's expecting that there's going to be another bubble burst or whatever you want to call it. But as long as, as everybody everybody's expecting it, it probably isn't going to happen. But once everybody becomes comfortable with the way things are again, that's when it will happen. How often do you douse for your own personal life key decision points? I douse everyone, every day. Did I just told you about dousing for this hotel room. Right. Yeah, I douse it every day. I keep these three cards and have, have them in my car. I have little uh, poker chips on, on the back of them. You know, same thing. Yes, no, doesn't matter. And I, I use it all the time because my brain wants to get involved. Now, when you say your brain, you mean your analytical mind. I guess that's what it is. The part that wants to know and imposes things on things. Yeah, we, don't, we don't really know those things. We think we do. I'll, I always think of uh, saying that Will Rogers had is that the problems in this world aren't that we know so much or don't know so much. The problem is that we think we know stuff we just don't have any clue about. And that's what it really is. We just think we know so much more than we do. Do you teach, Bill? Oh, I teach, yes. Uh, I was actually president of the American Society of Dowsers for about a year. And I, I just, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, I was just a hard-nosed businessman, and I just couldn't come to grips with this nonprofit thing. People think that because it's nonprofit, you're not supposed to make money. That always bugged me because I don't care what it is. You, if you go stay in business, you need to make money. Absolutely. So anyway, I had a tough time for that. I think I resigned after, I don't know, I don't know, a little over a year was about all I could take that. Are you teaching classes where you live in Virginia or other locations? And I understand you travel a lot. Do you still travel a lot? Yes, I, I teach wherever I go. I had some really good classes this year in New Zealand. I have people in New Zealand that are just excellent, probably better than I am. And by the same token, I've taught a lot of people in Hawaii, but they just haven't seemed to grasp it. All of this last class that I taught this year in February, those people are following it up a little bit. So they may turn out to be all right. As a dowser, you know 
that it's not easy to do. It, it's very draining. And, and I take it very seriously. I don't want to miss anything. You're talking about the teaching of it, teaching Dowson. I'm talking about the doing of it. Okay. And that's why most people stop because they try to do something and they didn't get it right. But they're not willing to do what I call the first grade stuff. For me, the first grade stuff is just taking something like uh, playing cards and just taking two reds and a black and putting them down, upside down on a table and stirring them up and saying, please find a black card for me. And, you know, it took me probably three months to get so I could pick that most of the time. Now, are you using an L-Rod when you ask that question? No, the pendulum. But I can use L-Rods. L-Rods are just slower. They work just fine. I'll, look, your body knows all of these things. It's just up to you to learn to listen. But with respect to the cards, I just want to use that since that's what you brought up. If I'm using a pendulum and asking the question, can you show me the black card? You have to put the pendulum over each card, right? Yes. Okay. And then you'll get your yes or your no. Correct. Okay. I just want to bring the public into the logistics of it. I don't want to assume that every listener knows what we're talking about right now. Well, Um, I have these psychic fairs. In fact, there's one coming to Kentucky, I believe, in about a month. And they have them all over the world, really, because they're in New Zealand, in Australia. Uh, and they have a lot of people doing what I, what I call crazy things, uh, people like me. But but uh, I think I went to one of those fairs years ago, and I was showing people how to douse cards. I, I had a little booth there. And I was showing people how to douse the cards. And there was this one lady came along and just spread out 12 cards on the table and said, this one's red, this one's red, this one's black. She got them all right. Wow. Every one of them. And that's when I realized that, gee, you know, it wasn't about dowsing. If I could just train my brain to listen, I could listen like she did. Isn't that in a way what you do when you do animal communication? You listen. That's exactly right. Exactly right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. It's funny how sometimes you don't take action until people have died. I remember visiting my mother in an Alzheimer's facility in Studio City, and my cousins, Carol and Dan, were there. And I had this little tape recorder with me. My dad had passed on five years before. And I started to interview my cousins, Carol and Dan, about my parents because they were very close to them, and they knew them for many years even before they were married. I want you to know that I got the funniest most adorable stories about my mom and dad that I would have never heard otherwise. I kid you not. I found out that my dad, Buddy Greenhouse, used to invite people to massive parties, bring everybody together, and then they'd all get to the party and they go, where's Buddy? And he was not there. In other words, he would just put the whole thing together, get everybody to come, and sometimes he would not show up. Now, you may not think that's funny. You may think that's rude and all that, but I thought that was hysterical. When I first heard about it, it's just not something that I would think that my dad was capable of, but apparently he was. Many of you listening to the show are going to wait until your parents and your sisters and brothers and cousins pass on before you ever capture the wonderful stories and legacy of your family. I'm making a very special service available to those of you that would like me to interview your family and capture the wonderful stories that are the gift of your family legacy. It's a really special service. It's very confidential and private and can be done in either audio or video. Don't miss the occasion to capture the living legacy of your family and the great treasures that are sitting there. I'm a miner. I know how to get to those treasures. Call me at its rainmaking time at 626-398-8652. Thank you. And back to the show. Talk to us about a few more stories with animals, if you would. All right. I think one of the, my favorites of all time is I had been out to Phoenix, Arizona. to We'd been to a dowsing conference up at Flagstaff and came back. We're flying out of Phoenix and came back to Phoenix like a, a day ahead of when I was going to fly out. And that afternoon, I took my car back to Hertz, and there was a family pulled up. 
I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I think I told you I've been on a Jeff Rent show a few times. Yes. And Jeff always asked me to please go to a zoo and let him know what was going on, what I thought of it. So I knew they had a zoo in Phoenix, but I didn't have a clue where it was. And anyway, this car was about three children came came back. They were turning that car in, too. And they were talking about the animals. And I said, oh, is there a zoo close by here? They said, oh, yeah, it's just about three miles down the road. So instead of turning my car in, we went to the zoo. Walked in the zoo about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and walked around. And we were at the lion's den. And the bell went off to tell you it was 5 o'clock, closing time. Stood there for a few minutes. And it's this golf cart came by with two men in it. And the one man said, have you folks had a chance to see the elephants? And I said, no, we haven't. So he said, well, would you like to see them? And I said, sure. So along the way, you know, he asked a question what we did, and I told him I was an animal communicator. And he told me he was head of the zoo. So he took us around to where the elephant compound was. And they had a really nice elephant compound there. And they had two elephants there. They were different breeds. One was Hindu, and the other was Reba, as I can recall. Reba was inside. Of course, when he introduced me to the caretakers for the elephants, they all were extremely skeptical, as well they should be, because how could everybody do this? Anyway, Reba was, was inside in, in one of the, the places there, the ball bar, big bars. And I just asked Reba if she had anything wrong with it. She said, yes. Yeah. She said, my foot hurts. So I asked her which one, and she told me, and then, of course, they couldn't believe it. And Reba walked over to the bars and held up her left front hoof, and I guess that's what you call it. Anyway, they could see there was actually something stuck in her hoof. So that kind of changed a lot of people's minds, and then she said she had another spot that hurt, and she turned around and put her butt up against the bars, and sure enough, she had something stuck in her skin there. And this was changing these people by this time. There was another e elephant named Indu who had gotten so she didn't like people. And she happened to be all the way at the other end of the compound. They said she just doesn't like people anymore. We can't even get close enough to her to give her a bath. She just doesn't like people. So I started asking her what was wrong, and her big problem was she said that they keep taking my red stuff away. They've taken it all away from me. And I didn't know what she was talking about, but they knew. And what they had done was she, every day she would get watermelon, but she had gotten so she was leaving the watermelon, and they thought it was because she didn't like it. She was actually saving it for her dessert. <laughs> She told me what was going on, and, uh, you know, of course, everybody was you know, absolutely in amazement of, of what was going on. And she grabbed the inner snout. I could still see her. She grabbed in her snout a great big bundle of, of uh, uh, I can't think what it is to eat now, but branches and stuff. And she started trotting over to where I was, which is right a little ways away. And the caretakers were all saying, Bill, she can get to you where you are. Move back. Her, her Bill, move back. And finally they pulled me out of her way, and she just came right up to where I was and dropped the whole, it's bamboo is what she eats. She dropped the whole snout full of bamboo right at my feet. Wow. Is that a gift? <laughs> I'll never forget that. Never. <laughs> so did they start giving her her watermelon again? Yes, they did. She became friendly the day they gave it to her. That is so cute. Yeah. That was just always stick in my mind because that was the first time I'd ever worked with an elephant. It really hurts me the way a lot of animals are treated around the world and the way they're murdered. It really, yep. really hurts me. Have you ever heard of the gentleman who was censored on the TED Talks, Rupert Sheldrake? No. Well, he's a scientist who wrote dogs that know when their owners are coming home and other explained powers of animals. He's a scientist in England. Okay. And he's worked on telepathy in animals for like 35 plus years. All right. And he gave an 18-minute talk on one of the TED Talks. It's kind of like this uh, national platform where people can go, speakers can go speak for 18 minutes, and they censored his talk. Okay. And the board of directors of TED basically said it was rubbish. It was not real science. 
Yeah, I hear that all and the time. And here this man had done over 35 years of research as a scientist in this area. Do you ever do anything on shows that's impromptu? Do you ever look at a dog and just give some impression? I have done that. And also what you're talking about, I've been scheduled to speak at uh, a conclave or a group or whatever of scientists. And all of a sudden, when the head person found out that I was going to be a speaker, he demanded that I show him some credentials and proof that I could actually do this, some scientific basis for it. Yeah, people and, are really irrational. They get really scared. <laughs> yeah, so since there was, was no way, I even had a physicist from the University of Pennsylvania send him uh, an email sort of explaining this through quantum physics, and the fellow still didn't go for it. So they canceled me. I'm so sorry about that. Do you, <laughs> well, do you I mean, I really? That, that, that although we, the schools would like for us to think that they're a bastion of higher education, <laughs> they really aren't. They want to just keep on talking about what they think they know. And, of course, the peer review process blocks most new knowledge. And, oh, it does. You know, and, and then they really tell it's... Me there in Kentucky, some of the professors that I know tell me, Bill, I'm sorry, but I can't be seen with you. God, when you really think about it, people are really chickens, aren't they? They're little chickens. Well, look, this is a big job for, for these people. They get paid pretty high salaries for what they do, and they don't want to take a chance on losing that. I do understand that side of it. I do. No. But, you know, it's kind of like the hundredth monkey, don't you think? If even the first Big Ten just agree to stand up and challenge the dogma of science, a whole new universe of opportunity opens. Actually, the knowledge that so many people have known for thousands of years, hundreds of years, et cetera, can get through. Well, I'm seeing that gradually. But just very gradually, things are changing here in Hawaii, in New Zealand, and where you are. People are open to this where you are. A, a lot of people are, anyway. But over here on the East Coast and, and a lot of part of the middle of the country, they still look at this stuff as coming from the devil. Yeah, no, I understand. Let's move away for just a moment from the animal side. If you're able to find water for somebody, that's really logistical. That's really practical. You're not a bridge between an animal and a human at that point. You are finding an asset. <laughs> Wouldn't they shut up then and get rid of their dogma and quit calling what you're doing demonic? No, I'll tell you a cute little story about that. Uh, about three years ago, a client of mine in New Zealand had asked me to mark a well site for him because he felt that the well he had probably wasn't going to last too much longer. So this year, or last year now, he had a well driller come and told him he needed to get a new well. And the well driller said, okay, well, you know, and he pulled out his, his uh, map. I forget what kind of map they call it. But anyway, he pulled it out and said, I think this is where we'll drill. And he said, no, you're going to drill right here, please. And he said, oh, I can't drill that. It's not going to be in the water there. He said, this is what the man told me now. He said, I told him that you marked that well site, and that's where the water was, and that's where he was going to drill. And sure enough, they drilled there, and the well driller said that was the best, <laughs> best site it's had in all of West Melton. By the way, what you're bringing up is the common clash between the culture of drillers <laughs> and an unwillingness to work with dowsers. In yep. fact, this is the cultural clash of all time because yep. they get paid again no matter what happens. But actually, the good ones and the ones with integrity will be open. Their job is to drill, and the dowsers' job really is to show where yep. and how far down yep. and to make sure it's drinkable water and that it's recoverable, correct? Correct. How much do your classes cost to take a class uh, from you? It's all on my website. It's just www.billnorland.com. And we can see things, which is like we talked about yesterday. We can often see things or hear things a couple weeks before they're bad enough for a veterinarian to see. And we're not the only ones now. There are plenty of good communicators. There was this lady that was on 
I think she was on Discovery Channel for a few years, and I can't think of her name right offhand, but she was really good. In fact, they followed me around uh, for probably two weeks when they were looking for a psychic to put on that show, and she was uh, did things. She had a lot more patience than I did. So they chose her, and it was a good decision that they did. But uh, I, I, my classes run usually about four and a half or five hours, and we just teach people to do the basics. I tell them it's sort of like learning to play the piano or musical instrument where the people show you where the notes are and how to play them, and then you have to go practice. Before we wrap up the show, talk to us about how you met Raymond Grace. Oh, I guess I guess it wasn't any uh, imaginary uh, big deal. At that time, I was going to the uh, Dowsing conventions up in Vermont, and you know I'd met Raymond. But one day, I just got a call from him, and he said he would like to come and learn how to listen to animals. So he came. And he was a good student. Raymond, of course, had his background in silver mind control. So he's already into this. It's sort of like, uh, do you do any NLP? I haven't, no. But I hear that silver mind control and NLP is very good and it's widely used. Yeah. Well, I do a little bit of NLP when I need to. Uh, and, and, of course, Raymond does too. Raymond's a very good fellow. And, and we communicate fairly often. When we don't just... just uh, shoot the bull or anything, but if, if either one of us has anything important to tell the other, we do it. He's very good at cleaning water, isn't he? Yeah, and like I told you, I know it works just because in New Zealand one year, we had a jar of polluted water, and we had four of us working on that bottle of water to clear it all up, and you could see all all the stuff just disappear from in the water, and took it to a lab, the, well, that same afternoon, they took it to a lab. They didn't get around to checking it till the next day. And sure enough, we cleared it. It was, it was suitable for drinking. So I know that it can be done. Would you like to end with a final story for the public on animals? One good one was this year. There was a, I was in New Zealand, and there was a fellow called me, and he said, I've heard good things about you, and I've got a horse I need for you to come to see. And at that time, I didn't have a car available, so he said he'd come and collect me, which he did. And we went out there, and he had a trainer who was extremely skeptical about what we did. And, and so was the trainer's wife. But we needed somebody to take notes, so they both agreed to take notes. And as I was standing on, well, first of all, I asked the horse if she wanted to be a racehorse, and she said no, she was tired of it. So I told the man he didn't know me anything, just take me back home. And he said, well, Bill, at least find out what's wrong with it, why she doesn't like it, please. So I did. And I stood on her feet, and I could tell him how she was putting her weight on each hoof and where she hurt, all the little things that bothered her. And they took me home, paid me, and that was the end of it. Uh, I said, gee, you know, that, that fellow... Uh, skeptical as he is, they'll never get anything done with that horse. But three weeks later, somebody called me and said, Bill, did you see the first race today? And I said, no. Well, that horse you were working on won, just bolted away. And they had done everything we suggested. They had changed every shoe. You have to have a special fairy that understands that stuff. But they had done everything that we suggested, and the horse just improved greatly. And she paid $41 for one to win and $19 for one to place. And the owner had bet $500 to win on her. Wow. So he made almost $30,000 on that one race. If I were him, I would have written you a big thank you check. Well, he didn't write me a check, but he did come by and bring me a couple of nice little gifts. <laughs> People are unbelievable. <laughs> well, what say, look. The way I feel about this is as yeah. long as they recognize that we help them. Yes, that's so true. They, they pay us and recognize. So many people today don't want to pay you. That's true. They'll promise you, but they don't want to pay you. So that's why I take credit cards now. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the great Bill Northern at BillNorthern.com. Go and check out his site and his work. If you need any work done in dousing or animal communication, he's the man. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Would you say my three favorite words for all of the animal kingdom? It's rainmaking time. It's rainmaking time. It's rainmaking time. Thank you, Bill. 